Germaine Godfroy was a woman with strong desires. Born into a large peasant family in rural northwest France, she desired a better life. Albert Lulois offered her this, but he couldn't fulfill her other, more carnal desires. While Germaine would take several lovers, her actions one night in 1947 would lead to her having a date with Monsieur de Paris and his guillotine. Thankfully, the chances of any of us being involved in any of the criminal acts we cover on the show are small. However, the chances of us being affected by cybercrime are much higher. And that's where today's sponsor can help, Surfshark VPN. Over the past few months, several high-profile YouTubers have had their accounts stolen by hackers, so we thought it's about time we upgraded our security. A VPN is a virtual private network, and these allow you to encrypt the data you send via the internet. This helps to protect your sensitive information from not just hackers, but also from big businesses looking to track your online activities. Another great reason for using Surfshark VPN is to get access to content and services that may not be available where you live. For example, I'm a big fan of classic movies such as The Shawshank Redemption, but I can't watch it on Netflix in the UK. With Surfshark, all it takes are a few clicks and I'm listening to Morgan Freeman's dulcet tones. As a bonus for our viewers, you can use code WELLINEVER for 83% off, plus an extra three months free. Surfshark also offer a 30-day money-back guarantee so there's no risk if you decide it's not for you. So, simply follow the link in the description below to get the deal. Among the peasantry of 1930s France, the populace was primarily split between two groups, those who worked on farms eking out a living and the farmers themselves who, while still far from being landed gentry, generally lived a better life than their farmhands. It was this divide that Germaine Godefroy wished to cross. Born in Crosmier, a small rural commune in northwest France, in 1917, there were few prospects for Germaine growing up. She and her five siblings were raised solely by their mother after their father took his own life. It was very unlikely that Germaine could work her way out of poverty, but in her early 20s, an opportunity arose for her to marry her way out of it. She had begun a relationship with a man named Albert Leloy. His father owned a farm in Bougie and had decided to retire, leaving the farm to Albert, the youngest of his five sons. The pair's relationship was initially filled with passion and progressed at a pace. In 1937, 25-year-old Albert and 22-year-old Germain were married. She had done it. She had made the jump and life on the farm was going well. The couple hired farmhands and were making enough money to be able to put some away in savings. This was a far cry from Germaine's early life and for a while she may have been satisfied with her lot. However, a new issue would soon arise. Despite employing workers, there was still much to be done. Albert was accustomed to working long hours on the farm and so met this challenge head on. Naturally, at the end of the day, this left Albert with little energy for other things. Germaine was a hot-blooded woman, and so this just wouldn't do. Taking the situation into her own hands, she began having an affair with a married man named Pierre Cui, who was nearly 20 years her senior. Pierre hailed from the neighboring village of Parc, where he too had his own land. It would be while lying in bed with her new lover that Germaine would first voice her wicked thoughts. She began complaining about Albert, stating he was only interested in hunting and drinking before asking Pierre, can't we find a way to kill him? Pierre didn't seem shocked by this and the pair began discussing whether it would be best to shoot her husband or kill him with an ax. It's unclear whether Pierre believed this macabre pillow talk was anything more than Germaine's dark fantasies, a way of dealing with her current frustrations and nothing more. 
she would soon reveal that she had been deadly serious. By this point, the allure of farm life had very much died for Germaine, and so when Albert announced he too was fed up with it and wanted a change, he unwittingly won himself a reprieve. Despite starting well, the money the farm was bringing in was slowly diminishing. Albert was torn. He wanted to sell up and start a new business, but the land had been in the family for generations. Germaine made her position clear. With talk of an imminent second war with Germany, she believed that the couple should enjoy themselves while they can. And so the farm was sold for an amount that, adjusted for inflation, equated to roughly £300,000 sterling today. This wasn't to be squandered, however. Albert was determined to use it to start or buy a new business, so the majority was banked while he searched for work to support the couple. Eventually, he found a job working in a winery in the village of Bougie. In 1946, as France recovered from the Second Great War, Marcel Coutard, the owner of a business that distributed coal and wood in Bougie, decided it was time to sell up. Albert leapt at the chance to finally put his savings to use and start a new chapter. And so, after years of waiting, the Lulois finally had their new business, complete with their very own delivery truck. The American-built machine was left behind by the British Army after the Dunkirk evacuation some six years earlier. The vehicle had seen better days and would break down regularly. With their deliveries constantly being delayed or cancelled altogether, the business soon began losing customers. This once again put Albert and Germain's relationship under pressure, and Germain demanded Albert talk to Marcel Coutard about fixing the vehicle. Monsieur Coutard knew the truck had issues, but he had always relied on his in-house mechanic to keep it running. The mechanic was 20-year-old Raymond Boulussier, and as he had been without work since the business had been sold, he was more than happy to return. He looked over the truck and told Albert it would cost roughly 82,000 francs to repair, approximately two and a half thousand pounds today. This was a substantial amount, and so Albert told him to simply get it running while he considered further repairs. Unsurprisingly, the vehicle continued to break down, but Germaine didn't mind. She had started an affair with Raymond, and Albert, breaking down in the middle of nowhere, simply gave them more time to be together. Madame Lulois once again began discussing ways to bump off her husband with her lover. Much as with Pierre, while Raymond entertained her desire to kill her husband, he had no stomach to commit the act himself. While the pair were able to hide their relationship from Albert, secrets are hard to keep in a small village, and rumours began to swirl. These would eventually reach Albert's ears, with him confronting his mechanic. An altercation ensued, leading to Raymond being punched in the face. However, with Albert knowing little about fixing vehicles and with few other mechanics in the area, it wasn't long before Raymond was back working for the Lulois. As time went on and as Albert dithered on whether to pay Raymond to fully repair the truck, the business continued to lose customers. Germain knew that the money was there and that the business could be turned around. She believed she could run it better along with her young beau. There was just one person that had to be removed for that to happen. And if her lovers wouldn't do it, she would just have to take the situation into her own hands. Bouget is a quiet village, but this peace was shattered on the night of December the 10th, 1947. At around 11pm, 63-year-old Henri Bourgault awoke to loud banging and deathly screams at his front door. He was the Lulois' neighbour and quickly realised that the screams were those of a hysterical Germain. Her face was covered in blood and she pleaded with Henri to help her as someone had just murdered her husband. She then promptly fainted. Henri alerted the authorities and along with his son and another neighbour, he entered the Lulois property. They were met with a most gruesome scene. Albert 
was lying on his side in a bed. The wall against which the bed was situated was covered in blood and brain matter. The police were soon on sight and they discovered that Albert was still breathing, though they could do nothing to save his life. Commissioner Tarnike quickly turned his attention to Germaine. She had been the only witness to what had happened, so he began questioning her. According to Madame Lulois, she had been sewing in the lounge while Albert slept. Two men then barged into their home, one wearing thick glasses and a balaclava, while one went to stand guard outside. The other demanded money. The commotion had apparently awoken Albert, who shouted for Germain to give the men his wallet, which had some 100,000 francs inside. This was not enough for the robbers, and Albert then told Germain to give them the box that lay in one of the cupboards. Inside were the couple's savings. What happened next, Germain had difficulty recalling, until urged on by Tarnike. After a long pause, she stated that one of the men then launched at Albert, who let out a blood-curdling scream. She then fainted and awoke to find the bloody scene they were now presented with. But what of the cuts on your face? How did you get those? The investigator asked. Germain replied that she must have fallen on some broken glass before crying, my Albert, my money, and bursting into tears. An investigation was started immediately. Given how vicious the murder was, it was believed that officers might find a bloody footprint, but this wasn't to be. Instead, the first breakthrough came when they searched the kitchen. There, they discovered a bucket which contained water and blood. Had the killers attempted to clean the murder scene? What it had been used for would soon be revealed. The truck that had caused so much trouble for the Lulois was parked some 30 meters from the house. While searching the vehicle, officers removed the seat and discovered an axe. The blade had been washed, but it and the handle were still blooded. Why would the killers attempt to clean the weapon and place it inside the Lulois truck? There were numerous bodies of water around Bourget where they could have disposed of the axe. Why leave it so close to the scene? All these questions and more filled the investigators' heads, and the answers seemingly lay with Madame Lulois. She was taken to police headquarters and questioned further, but her story did not change. Further doubt was cast over her version of events when the police doctor stated he believed from how Albert's body was positioned that he had been fast asleep when the attack occurred. By this point, the police had been notified of Germain's affair with Raymond, which obviously made him a potential suspect. He was brought in and questioned, but denied any knowledge of the event and stated that he did not know who killed Albert. But if he did, they could leave him to deal with them, as Monsieur Lulois had been more than a boss. He was a friend. Knowing of the altercation between the pair and sensing an insincerity in his words, investigators decided to search Raymond's home. In his bedroom, they turned over the mattress on his bed and discovered Albert's wallet containing 82,000 francs. It was you who killed Albert Lelois. Here's the proof, the officers shouted. Raymond simply lowered his head and said nothing. Germain and Raymond were then questioned together. Confronted with the new evidence, Germain stated she was just a woman who had taken a lover and not a criminal. She pointed to the scars on her face. How could an accomplice receive wounds such as these? It was Raymond who had killed Albert, she shouted. Raymond's quiet demeanor was shaken as he snapped back. It's not true. You know very well that it's not true. When asked again if she believed Raymond to be the killer, Germain recanted and instead shifted the blame to her previous lover, Pierre Cue, whom she claimed had threatened to shoot Albert unless she left her husband for him. Pierre was questioned but denied the allegations, stating their relationship was purely physical and when it ended, he had no great reason to resent Monsieur Lulois. These interrogations had all taken place the day after the murder, and as the clock ticked around to 7.30 p.m., 
Germaine finally cracked. She quietly murmured that she could take it no longer before stating, It's neither Boulissia or Cui who killed him. It's me. Just me. She had invented the story of the raid on their family home many days before the murder, and while she had discussed shooting or poisoning her husband with Raymond, she eventually decided an axe would be her weapon of choice. On December the 6th, four days before the tragic event, she had her lover sharpen the blade and shorten the handle to make it less conspicuous. She then disguised it in a pile of wood she carried into the house before hiding it beneath the stove in the kitchen. On the day of the murder, she had argued with Albert after the truck once again broke down. Albert then left to go hunting. Later that evening, around 7 p.m., Germain met with Raymond and gave him the wallet which contained enough money to carry out the repairs needed on the truck. She then waited for her husband to return home and fall asleep before recovering the axe and using it to hit Albert twice in the head while he slept. Afterwards, she set the scene and used a razor to cut her face to make it seem as though she had been hurt during the supposed break-in. Despite now having this confession, it would take almost a year for Germain Lulois and Raymond Boulissier to be sentenced. The pair were tried at the Assizes Court in maine et loire and both were found guilty. Boussilia was charged with being an accomplice to the crime and was sentenced to 10 years of hard labor. During Germaine's trial, she was portrayed as being unintelligent and argumentative with questionable morality and on November the 26th, 1948, she was sentenced to death. While at the time the guillotine was still in use, a change in French law in 1870 meant that the country had only one executioner. By law, he had to live in the capital and colloquially, he was known simply as Monsieur de Paris, the man from Paris. The condemned were only informed of their impending date with Monsieur de Paris on the day of their execution, and Germain Lulois would receive this information at 4.30 a.m. on April the 21st, 1949. Her cellmates helped her dress, and from there, she went to speak with the chaplain and attended mass before writing a final letter. She then had her hair trimmed and neck bared in preparation. Madame Lulois was then offered a final cigarette and glass of rum, but she declined. At 5.30 a.m., Lulois left her cell and made her way to the courtyard before being laid out and strapped to the guillotine. Then, much like with Albert two years earlier, the blade fell and death followed. Once again, a big thank you to this episode's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Simply click the link in the description below to grab 83% off and get three months free. Right then, take care, and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.